Yeah, I mean, that's it. But it seems that we are not. Is it working now? Mm. Yes. yes, I mean, that's it. But it seems that we are not. It is streaming now. OK, so everyone who has the YouTube open, please uh, mute the mic so we don't have background noise. And with that, over to you. OK, so shall we start? Let's. Okay, so uh, we're all here to, today to uh, listen to uh, Antonia Mashuzari Shalitz, who uh, is going to defend uh, PhD thesis entitled uh, Development of Subject Specific Representations of New Anatomy via Domain Specific Language. Um, so, Antonia, you, you have uh, approximately 45 minutes to present uh, your, your PhD, and then uh, we're going to move on to questions. So, it's uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. I will now share my screen. And please confirm that you can see it all right. Yes, we can. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming virtually. Uh, my name is Antonia, and I will be presenting the work that I conducted during my thesis under the supervision of Dr. Demian Wasserman at INRIA paris the title of my work is Development of Subject-Specific Representations of Neuroanatomy via a Domain-Specific Language. This presentation is divided in three parts. First, I will look at neuroanatomy and neuroimaging analyses. I will go over the relevance of SOLSI in neuroscience and how we use this information to create an organization of the cortex, which we use as a basis in this work. I will then go over brain mapping techniques when we image the brain and our proposition for a new approach to fit into the current brain mapping field. In part two, I go over the design and implementation of Neuralang. I look at how we construct queries in Neuralang using translations of neuroanatomy, the experiments that we conducted using those queries, and the results from those experiments where we look at cell C both on the individual level and on the group level. In part three, I look at the implications of our work. I I present how we derived a method to quantify the stability of SOLSI from our experiments, as well as the overall implications of Neuralang. I look at any limitations or open questions of our work that we discovered along the way, and the conclusions that we draw and our overall contributions to the field of brain mapping. So our overall objective in this work was to create a sulcal mapping technique, which is based on individual spatial geometry. The purpose of this is to conserve the individual variability of SOLSI. And by doing this, we create a way to systemically navigate across the cortex. We can look at individual sulcal morphologies. We can analyze group level sulcal patterns as well as group level sulcal stabilities. And the main message that I want to convey is that we represent here classical neuroanatomy of SOLSI using queries. This can tell us that labeling subject specific sets of SOLSI using spatial geometry can act as a complement to current template based methods for sulcal identification. And it can aid in subject specific correlations of other structural or functional features. So the first question we need to ask is why are we looking at SOLSI specifically? The brain is very complex and we are looking specifically at the cortex, which is the outermost layer of the brain. It's very thin and it's highly convoluted. The outer protrusions of these convolutions are called gyri or singular gyrus, and the inner folds are called sulci or singular sul sulcus. Sulci have been used for reference in neuroanatomy since the beginning of neuroanatomy itself. And this is because sulci are actually visible by eye on the brain ex vivo, and you can actually trace the formation of sulci from the surface when looking at the brain ex vivo. So they've been used since the beginning of neuroanatomy as reference landmarks. And by using them as landmarks, we can actually parcelate the brain into different areas. So by using certain sulci to delineate different areas, which we call lobes, we show that they have relationships with not only structurally distinct areas, but also functionally distinct areas. For example, the central sulcus splits the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And these areas are not only geographically different, but they also have different functions. Another area where sulci are relevant is the field of comparative anatomy. So humans are not the only species with highly convoluted cortices. 
So we can use SOLSI as a certain metric to look at the similarities or differences between humans and other species, particularly primates. So there's a beautiful schematic here from Hewer et al. in 2019, comparing to scale human brains and 33 other primate brains. And by looking at certain metrics of SOLSI, such as they looked at depth or fold wavelength, we can compare between ourselves and other species to look at not only the differences and how human species have evolved over time, but also at like particular features which make humans unique. Another field where SOLSI are relevant is developmental neuroanatomy. So the brain starts off as a very, very small, smooth surface. And then over time, it starts to fold in on itself. This happens mostly during gestation, but it also continues through to adulthood. So people have been tracking these changes of sulcal formation from the beginning of um, embryonic development. For example, Chi et al. In, in 1977 manually drew the formation of these sulci over time. And with the advent of neuroimaging, we can actually make more accurate 3D representations of how these changes happen over time in the brain. And by tracking these changes, we can actually see what affects brain development and what relationships these might have with other brain features, such as maybe white matter pathways. So we looked at all of the information we could find on the SOLSI in the literature, and we found that there was a large overlap between the sources of sulcal descriptions, but there was also a large disparity. So this disparity came not only from descriptions of SOLSI themselves, but also their nomenclature. So we gathered three gold standard neuroanatomy sources, the Destrier paper from 2010, which was the basis of the Destrier Atlas, Rademacher et al. 1992, which was the basis of the Harvard-Oxford Atlas, and Ono et al. from 1990, which they looked at SOLSI from manual segmentations of 20 brains. And we created our own hierarchical organization of sulcal reliability from these literature sources. We use this as a basis to have an idea of how reliable are each of the SOLSI based on literature descriptions. And using this as a basis, we constructed our own neural length taxonomy um, based on the reliability from the literature, but we also incorporated the feature of spatial organization of SOLSI. So within each tier, we rearrange them so that they, they line up to where they exist on the cortex, split up into lobes. These are all in reference to the primary SOLSI, which as I mentioned before, make excellent reference points because they have certain consistent characteristics which make them excellent reference points. Among those are that their location is always consistent. They are among the deepest of the SOLSI in the brain because they're among the first to develop. They have consistent shapes and consistent relationships to surrounding SOLSI. They have low susceptibility to other influences, also because they're among the first to develop. And they're reliable to always be existent in all healthy brains. So we have this understanding of how brain anatomy works. How do we look at the how do we look at this when we image the brain? Well, a gold standard method for looking at brain anatomy in imaging is to use templates. Templates for atlases work by having a predetermined set of regions which are previously acknowledged, and a template can warp a model image onto any given brain. This is highly efficient for large scale analyses. However, by definition, since there is a predetermined set of brain regions, there is a loss of inter-individual variability. And this is exactly the variability that we want to conserve in our work. There are also other sulcal parcellation techniques which extract SOLSI and automatically label them, such as the Brain Visa, Brain Visa Atlas or the Mars Atlas. And similar to the Mars Atlas, our method is based on the spatial organization of cortical SOLSI in, in, in reference to certain landmarks. However, a key difference is that we want to label sets of SOLSI per subject based on individual morphology. So what we wanna do is first determine the existence of a sulcus and then label it. Um, by doing this, we hope that we can include a lot more of the unreliable or unstable tertiary SOLSI, which are often overlooked in current atlases or current templates. So we propose to use spatial geometry Spatial geometry refers to the structure and relationships of objects in a space. This can be in terms of points or lines or boxes or other geometric shapes. We will expand on the idea of using interval algebra 
to relate these objects in space. This was explained by um, Navarrete et al. in 2013 and Dilla et al. in 2017. And I'll go more into detail about how these relationships work. But the point is that you can relate objects in space to each other on a 2D plane. And since we have a 3D space using the brain, we take the 2D planes of each of the dimensions to relate objects to each other. So the x-axis represents the medial lateral relationship. The y-axis is the anterior posterior. And the z-axis is the superior inferior. And by doing this, we're able to prioritize the qualitative relationships of sulci over the individual sulcal morphologies. To do this, we will be using first order logic. So first order logic is a type of logic used in many different fields, including mathematics and philosophy for representing knowledge. It is composed of syntax and semantics, very much like English, where syntax tells us about the structure of a sentence and semantics tells us its meaning. In first order logic, you have object within a domain. A domain is just a specific sphere of knowledge on which you want to work. Within a domain, you have certain predicates which are used over objects, and you can combine these to create formulae. We will be using query, which are formulae with a specific form. From formulae, you can have the creation of axioms, which are able to capture foundational concepts within a given domain. As an example, I have a poster here from a website about how to explain coronavirus to children which gives you some basic information about what the coronavirus is. So we can use first order logic to represent this information. So if we acknowledge that we have certain objects in this knowledge here, we can use predicates over those objects and combine that information to represent the knowledge on this poster. And if we break this down, we can see that we have certain objects such as I or common cold or flu. We have predicates which give relationships or characteristics to those objects. For example, virus is a characteristic characterizing the object and cousins gives a relationship between two objects. And you have formulae which give you information of a predicate over an object. And this can be either one case or the conjunction of many formulae together. So in this way, you can represent the knowledge on this poster without losing anything along the way. And then from this, you can extract more knowledge, such as if you also have an axiom which tells you that there cannot exist X, such that X is a cousin of itself, you can therefore understand that the coronavirus is not the flu, and the coronavirus is also not the common cold. So we've shown here how SOLSI are relevant to neuroscience and why we want to look at these these structures specifically. We identified sulcal mapping as it exists now and how we can contribute to this field. We looked at how we can use the brain space spatial geometry to navigate across the cortex. And we introduced the basis of first order logic and how we can use this to represent knowledge for the construction of queries. So how can we use all of this knowledge to contribute to sulcal mapping by conserving sulcal inter-individual variability? We showed how we created an organization of the sulci and a semi-hierarchical structure, both based on sulcal reliability from the literature and from spatial organization. We'll show how we carried out the manual segmentation of 454 sulci from 10 brains as ground truth, and how we constructed 35 sulcus-specific queries, which were translations of classical neuroanatomy, and we will look at its implications. So to begin with, how will we use first order logic to translate neuroanatomy? So neuroanatomy will be, be our domain here, where the objects are the sulci. The predicates will be built into our system as translations of neuroanatomical relationships. And sulcus specific queries, which will be formulae with a specific form, which are translations of anatomical descriptions. So we start with the predicates. We have two types of predicates those that denote relative relationships and those that denote characteristics. To show how we, we determine relationships between two sulci, we use minimum bounding boxes around each sulcus. This is taken from Navarrete et al. in 2013, as I mentioned before. So you have a certain space around each box, a minimum bounding box. And in this way, you can relate objects in space to each other on a 2D plane using these boxes. If there is no overlap between the boxes, 
then we say that there is absolute relativity between them. If there is a minimum of one voxel overlap on the 2D plane in that dimension, we say that there is at least partial relativity between them. In this case, the target, or the target sulcus would be, let's say, anterior to the origin sulcus. And in the case where there is more than one partial relativity between two sulci, you can take the proportion of each relationship and look at which one has the majority. In this case, the target sulcus would be, let's say, anterior of the origin, overlapping the origin, and posterior of the origin. Then you look at the proportion of each relationship, and you can take the majority to be the dominant relationship. In this case, clearly, the dominant relationship would be anterior of. So we can say that this target sulcus would be anterior dominant of the origin. Another predicate that we create, another type of predicate that we create is the transformation of, of sulci into groups of planes. This is taken from the literature where sulci are described as being either on the medial plane or lateral or superior or ventral in relation to the colossal sulcus. Furthermore, sorry, furthermore, we have sulci in categories where a sulcus is either a primary sulcus or not, and it is either unlabeled, which means that it has not been identified by a query, and then when it is identified, it is put into the found sulci category and then omitted from subsequent searches. So an example of how this works is if we look at examples here where the central sulcus is the origin and the inferior frontal sulcus is the target. We know from anatomical descriptions that the inferior frontal sulcus exists in the frontal lobe anterior to the central sulcus. So we can describe this as the inferior frontal sulcus being anatomically anterior of the central sulcus. If we want to look at a more ambiguous case, we can take the precentral sulcus. In some cases, there might be overlap between them, but in some cases, maybe not. Maybe sometimes it's absolutely anterior of. However, we know for sure that there is at least partial relativity. So we can say that the precentral sulcus is anterior of the central. But if we want to make more complex formulae so that maybe we can capture more of the variability across many different brains, we can use the logical connective of or denoted by this bar here to say that the precentral sulcus is either anterior dominant of the central or overlapping anteriorly dominant of the central sulcus. And in this way, we hope to capture a lot of the variability which might exist in in a larger data set, but we're also staying true to the anatomical descriptions in the literature. So we wanted to construct queries which reflect this. So we look directly at sources in your anatomy. We take, for example, descriptions for the inferior frontal sulcus from four sources, and we look specifically at how this sulcus may relate to primary sulci, which are our reference landmarks. We can construct queries which are reflections of those. We mentioned before how a candidate which would fulfill the requirements for the inferior frontal sulcus would be anatomically anterior of the central sulcus. And we also see from the literature that it would be anatomically superior of the anterior horizontal ramus of the lateral fissure. We also know that it exists on the lateral plane, so it exists as part of the group of lateral sulci. And we also know that it's not a primary sulcus. If we show how this would look in a schematic, we can show how this query will remove all options that are posterior to the central and inferior to the anterior horizontal ramus of the lateral fissure and remove everything that's on the medial plane. So we're left here with a quadrant of the brain where any candidate which fulfills these requirements is taken as a result of this first query. However, in some cases, like this case, for example, we might have sulci which fulfill these requirements, but there's more than one result. In this case, maybe we take the middle frontal sulcus as well. In such a case, we have a secondary query, which looks at the results of the first query, all of the candidates, and it compares them each and takes one which takes a requirement of what you want. In this case, we want from all of the options, the most lateral sulcus. And the most lateral sulcus is represented as having the largest X coordinates. So we have, again, relationships medial lateral plane using the x-axis. So we compare pairs of sulci between 
the results of the first query. And we say that there doesn't exist a candidate which has smaller X coordinates than the one that we want. And in this way, we can remove all other options. And then the final result is highlighted here in red. So we did this for 35 SOLSI. And we wanted to run experiments where we could look specifically at three things. First, the success of the queries themselves. So how well do these queries perform? How well do they identify SOLSI? And the, those SOLSI that they identify, are they correct? We wanted to see if we could identify SOLSI in the hierarchical order that we determined from our Neuralang taxonomy. And we wanted to look specifically at SOLCO patterns individually and on the group level. To do this, we carried out two types of experiments with two data sets. One type of experiment with two data sets. First, on subjects which had their SOLSI manually segmented. So this meant that we had ground truth in terms of what the SOLSI actually looked like. And we also ran it on subjects which had their SOLSI extracted using a software, Mindboggle. So we did manual segmentation of 10 subjects. And we did this to get an idea of ground truth SOLCO morphology and ground truth absolute position of SOLSI on the cortex. We did this, as, this also helped us in the design process for the queries because the queries were designed using the Destrio Atlas, which is one of the current gold standard methods. Um, and we also adapted the queries based on our observations while segmenting the SOLSI. So then we tested our queries on these 10 subjects, which were from the Human Connectome Project dataset. We had a total of 454 SOLSI. And this work was done in collaboration with Dr. Nikos, Dr. Nikos Macris at Harvard University. And together we established the guidelines for, for which to segment and label SOLSI incrementally. And we carried out all the segmentations according to the guidelines from our Neuralang taxonomy. And all the segmentations were um, confirmed by Dr. Macris as well. So next we ran the same queries in the same order on 52 subjects of the Human Connectome Project data set, which had their folds extracted using the software Mindboggle. So Mindboggle can extract SOLSI on the basis of their, extract folds on the basis of their depth. And then they have the option that you can extract SOLSI from those folds based on the Deskin Kiliani Tourville Atlas labeling system. Now we wanted to avoid any pre-existing Atlas labeling system because we wanted to do the labeling ourselves. So we decided to use the folds extracted from Mindboggle instead of the SOLSI themselves, which would have been segmented using an Atlas. So we ran this, we extracted 33 folds per hemisphere and we ran our Neuralang queries in original ACPC space from the HCP dataset. And then our results were non-linearly registered to MNI space. And by lining up our structures across all of the subjects this way, we get a better understanding of the actual group level query success. And we could also look at peak coordinates such as maximum voxel. So if we look back at what we originally wanted to examine through experimentation, we could examine the success of queries through two metrics, specificity of a query, so the proportion of how many query cell seeds did the query actually find in a population and sensitivity, which is out of those cell seeds, how many were actually correct. So first we can look at specificity from the probability maps where we see in how many subjects did a query actually identify a sulcus. And sensitivity, we look at using um, metrics of absolute position on the cortex and stability, which we will look at further down the line. Next, we looked at how well did the SOLSI incrementally identify, how well did the queries incrementally identify SOLSI in a hierarchical order? So did they conform to the order of stability that we expected from our taxonomy? And we actually found that no, they didn't conform to the order that we expected. And it was actually easier to label, we got better results from the query labeling system when we first looked for the SOLSI, which were on the ex extreme ends of each axis, and then closer moving to the center. So first the extreme ones, and then the ones which were closer to the primary SOLSI. And then we wanted to look specifically at SOLCO patterns. First, we looked at SOLSI patterns on the individual level. 
So if we look at the original MRI images for each subject, we can look at the manifestations of each query. I have here the cingulate sulcus, the query for the cingulate candidate, and the results of this query in one subject, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. And we can see how we can look at the actual individual morphology of sulci based on just using the queries as reflections of, of neuroanatomy. Now, this is a really clear example, the cingulate sulcus, of where this, where this works really well, where you could clearly see that this query was looking for the cingulate sulcus. But we also still sh show some examples of where the query may have mislabeled or not carried out the proper separation between two sulci. We show the precentral sulcus, for example, which has a complex query here because it's so close to the central sulcus. And in the right hemisphere of a subject, we see that it correct, it seems to have correctly labeled the sulcus. But in the left hemisphere, it seems to have been grouped together with the surrounding sulci, like the superior frontal sulcus. So we show here how we have a method for mass identification of individual sulcal morphologies. This can be quite relevant when you consider other studies which have been done to look specifically at sulci using manual segmentation. For example, Paus et al. in 1996 looked specifically at the cingulate sulcus and the paracingulate sulcus on the medial surface and did this by manually segmenting 247 brain images. Um, Another example is Alan, uh, Bruce, and Damasio in 2006, who looked at the lunate sulcus. Again, they had to manually go through 105 brains to look at individual morphologies. And this is highly time consuming, but this was necessary because the lunate sulcus is highly disputed, and there's not a standard way of segmenting this in templates. More recently, Sprungmoch and Petridis looked at the variable sulci in Broca's area, specifically the sulcus diagonalis. And again, they had to do this by manually segmenting 40 brains. So if we look back at what we can see from individual morphologies based on our query, we show how we have here a method which can act as a, a complement here for mass identification of sulci which might be highly variable or more unstable. Another, way, another field where this might be relevant is if we look at the relationship of sulci and cytoarchitectonics. Now this is disputed as well, if sulci can act as boundaries between cytoarchitectonic areas, but the problem is that there's just not enough data between the two of them to be conclusive. So we show here three, two examples of three brains each of where it looks like a tertiary sulcus, the cuneal sulcus, can act as a boundary to the primary visual cortex V1 and V2. This is shown in the probabilistic map from the Ulick Brain Atlas here. Similarly, the superior rostral sulcus might act as a posterior boundary to the FP1 area. And we show some examples here, some good examples here of where it looks like these two might have a relationship. But again, there's just not enough data here to be conclusive, but it's something that we could possibly look into using this method. So on the group level, there are specific questions we want to look into, which are also reflections of sensitivity of the queries. So are the query cells see first where we expect them to be from their descriptions? This is a reflection of how well do the queries actually identify cells see. We can look at this by matching how well the probability maps of the experiments using the mind boggle extracted folds lined up to their ground truth counterpart maps. And next, how reliable are each of the positions and morphologies for the query sulci? So we know that some sulci are more stable than others when it comes to where they actually exist and how spread is their data over a certain area. For example, superior frontal sulcus is expected to be relatively reliable in terms of its location, but other sulci like in the occipital lobe usually have more of a spread because they're more variable. So first we wanted to see how well do the query sulci from the mind boggle extracted folds where we didn't know their morphologies, how well did those line up to ground truth absolute position on the cortex? We looked at this by matching the, by calculating the interaction proportion of the query sulcus to its ground truth counterpart. Even though the absolutely highest value it could possibly be was 0.2, which is still relatively low, <clears throat> 
If we look at the relative comparisons between what is the highest overlap and the lowest, we see that actually within each lobe, the largest and deepest and what we expect to be the most stable within each lobe actually seems to have the highest proportion in terms of where it's supposed to be. So next we wanted to look at the stability of SOLSI in terms of how reliable are actually the spread of the possible observations. And to do this, we looked at the Hellinger distance average values. So the minimum Hellinger distance is a distribution divergence metric. It's a quantification of the similarity when it's closer to zero or the disparity when it's closer to one between two probability distributions. Probability mass distributions are what we use to calculate the probability measures of the possible values for each observation of query Celsius. And we used the Hellinger distance to map the distance between these two probability mass distributions. So to have an idea of the most stable Celsius possible, we use the Destrio Atlas to extract Celsius, the primary Celsius, and compare them to each other. So for each primary sulcus, we calculated the average Hellinger distance values of the primary sulcus to each of the four others. So the most stable it could possibly be is 0 0.08, and the rest of the values are in, in relation to that. So we show here the stability of each sulcus from most stable to least stable. Again, closer to zero is the more stable, um, and they are in order of the left hemisphere. And we can see that as we expected, the cingulate actually has the highest stability. It is a large and deep sulcus on the medial surface, and it actually delineates lobes from the limbic lobe. Um, and in the, in the least stable end here, we have sulci which are highly variable, and we expect them to be in the tertiary sulci tier, such as the lunate sulcus or um, one of the occipital lobe sulci or the temporal polar sulcus. So in this part, we've shown how we created sulcus-specific queries as translations of neuroanatomy. We showed how we're able to look at individual morphologies of sulci, as well as population-level statistics on absolute positions of sulci on the cortex and stabilities. So what can we do with this information? Well, you, we use the Hellinger distance average values of each sulcus as a metric of sulcus stability. And if we go back to our original Neuralang taxonomy, and we see how sulci are organized in terms of their spatial variability, sorry, spatial organization, and we illustrate over that our quantification of sulcal stabilities within our population, we can actually have an idea of how stable sulci are, not only just on the whole brain level, but also on the lobe level. So this becomes more clear if we look at our taxonomy side by side. We show how the whole brain average stability of our population was 0.48. And we can use, we can look specifically at different lobes to see how they compare to this whole brain average stability. From our taxonomy, we see that the left side of the pyramid is the frontal lobe. So we can look specifically at frontal lobe sulci and compare them to other lobes such as the occipital lobe, for example. If we compare the sulci in terms of which ones were more stable relative to the whole brain average, we see that the frontal lobe had eight out of 13, which had values below 0.48, and a whole, whole brain average stability of 0.41. And the occipital lobe only had one out of eight, which had a value lower than 0.48. Remember, the closer to zero, the more, the more stable it is. We can continue and do this for the rest of the lobes as well. And by doing this, we can actually look not only at whole brain average stability of our population, but also between each lobe and compare them and see within each lobe which one is more stable and which one is less stable. So overall, we've shown how the 35 queries that we create as translations of neuroanatomy, they're, they're mutable and they can be used in order to look at individual sulci. So they're not only translations of neuroanatomy in terms of how has how SOLSI have been defined for centuries, now we can actually use that in a way that the computer can understand and map. They're also mutable so they can be changed according to whatever definition of neuroanatomy you need for your analysis. There's also the option that you can include or exclude a secondary query, which looks at the results of the first query and then searches for a specific one. This can be useful if you're looking for only one sulcus or only one segment or five 
segments, for example. Next, we showed how we create data-driven approaches for SOCO morphology analyses. We can look at individual subject level SOCO morphology and group level SOCO morphology through probability maps. And next, finally, we show data-driven method for quantifying SOCO stability within a given population. By doing this, we can look at individual SOCO stabilities as well as whole brain level stabilities and lobe level stabilities. However, our method is far from perfect. As I mentioned before, there was an, a low overlap of query results when it came to absolute position of cell C on the cortex. So this can either be an indication of higher specificity of queries, but a lower sensitivity, meaning that the query will most likely identify a sulcus, but it wasn't necessarily the correct one. Or it can be an indication of the way that we manually segmented the sulci. So I did the manual segmentation myself, and most of the time it was just a single line along the fundus of the sulcus. So this may not match up quite well in terms of the sulci that Mindboggle boggle extracts. It can also be an indication that we can have an improved position validation method, such as using the Mindboggle boggle desikin kiliani tourville atlas to compare absolute position instead of our own ground truth. Another limitation is the possibility of the follow through of mislabeling. So if a query mislabels a sulcus and then that sulcus is omitted from subsequent searches, this creates a follow through problem. And a possible amelioration for this would be to have checkpoints at certain points during the process, perhaps after the identification of all sulci in a lobe. Open questions, which we discovered along the way, include how we could incorporate sulcus trajectory into our work. So we looked at how we could use star calculus to represent sulcus orientation, which is often included in anatomical descriptions. This work was done in collaboration with Valentin Yoven, where we took the 3D coordinates of sulci and projected them onto a 2D plane. And then we matched its linear regression line to the closest PCA main direction. This work was inspired by the hip hop method by Ozia et al. in 2013, where they had 2D coordinate system of all of the sulci in terms of longitude and latitude in this cortical organization in relative to reference points. And also of Toro and Bernard in 2003, where they created a geometric model of the stereographic projection of the brain using reference points as axes. And then the sulci were either given radial or axial coordinates. However, in the end, our method using star calculus did not actually aid in, the, in a better identification of Celsi, so we excluded it from the final experiments, but it's something that we would like to go back, back to. Furthermore, it would be a, a good next step to incorporate gyro labeling into Neuralang. Celsi many times act as the boundaries for gyro areas. Um, so the next step logically would be to include gyro labeling. However, this comes with its own complications, such as if a sulcus is not bounding entirely gyrus, where do you actually stop? This is something that I'm sure a lot of other people have dealt with and we will come up against ourselves. Um, and next, I uh, would also like to incorporate cytoarchitectonics into our method. Because as I mentioned before, it's suggested that there might be relationships of sulci and cytoarchitectonics, but to be able to have a probabilistic atlas along with our individual morphological method, we could see this more clearly. So overall, we've shown how we created individualistic sulci identification of sulci. We showed how we created a semi-hierarchical organization of sulci both from literature descriptions in terms of reliability and spatial organization, and an organization of the cell C based on sulcal stability. Overall, our, our representation of queries as translations of sulcal definitions is able to bridge the gap between classical neuroanatomy and computational neuroimaging. We hope our work to be a complement to current template-based methods especially when it comes to the mass identification and labeling of tertiary sulci, which are often overlooked in current templates. And with that, I'd like to say thank you, especially to my supervisor, Damien, without whom this work would not have been possible. I particularly wanna say thank you for the way he handled being a supervisor during a pandemic, which was not easy. And he handled it with a lot of empathy and kindness. I also wanna thank our collaborator, Nikos Makris, um, as well as all the members of the jury, thank you for taking the time to read my thesis and for all of your kind and insightful comments.
I want to thank a and Euroref and ERC Neuralink for funding this work. And finally, I extend my thanks to all the members of the Paraetal team at INRIA Paris-Saclay and all the members of the Athena team at INRIA Sofia Antipolis, where I spent my first year. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Antonia. So uh, we can uh, now move to questions. Uh, so can everybody, yeah, everybody's back. So um, I will first uh, uh, give uh, the questions to uh, Roberto Toro, who's the first reviewer and uh, he's the director de recherche at uh, Institut Pasteur in Paris. So Roberto. Thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation, very clear. Thank you. Um, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a very different approach to what we often see in, in your anatomy. I, I, I like very much uh, reading the manuscript was also very interesting. I think that the, 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 the exercise of trying to bridge all the knowledge that's sitting in those no, in your anatomy books with the very uh, recent techniques in, in informatics and, and com computational neuroimaging was, was, really, was really exceptional. Um, so uh, I, I have a, a few questions. So the, the first one would be uh, concerning the, the um, pr probably the, 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 the coordinate system that underlies all these queries. You know, the, this is basically a, a coordinate system defined in, in space, mm -hmm. the X, Y, and, and Z coordinates and planes and stuff. Uh, although uh, in the nervous system, in particular in the in the primate nervous system, we know that there's a, a, a bending of the like if you compare it with the nervous system of a, a lizard that would be straightened up, then the nervous system of a primate is something that's like folding like this, no? um, which makes that the the whole brain is kind of turning. So the the you know what what you normally call a dorsal should be actually what's actually down and not really what's what's actually you know like dorsal it's not really what what, what you mm -hmm. could imagine from a, from a lizard um, so and then so my, my question would be um, what's the the real justification for a, a, an orthogonal volume based coordinate system would it make sense to have a, a coordinate system that would be probably based on on the surface more than, than in volume space. Um, uh, I, I think that I, 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 will, I will stick with that. So the, and yeah, pr probably, probably a, another one that goes in, in the same sense, like I, I'm trying to group the, the question. Mm -hmm. So why the, the coordinate system like this? And then um, also the, the definition of, the, now probably I will keep that one for the next. <laughs> Okay, so um, as I understand it, you're asking why didn't we use geodesic distances along the surface to compare? Yeah, uh, it could be a, a coordinate system that turns, no? Right. So well, in, 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 in mice, the, you have the frontal here and the temporal, it's like, like back there. Mm -hmm. but in, in humans, it, it like folds back to the front. Right. So in, 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 it wouldn't be X, Y, Z. Any, so if you were to define a neural lang for mice, mm -hmm. Would it have to be different, like the X, Y, Z coordinates than for humans or? Yeah, I'm actually not familiar with the, the geometry of the mouse brain itself, but it would be interesting to see how we could translate it to other primates. That's something that would be interesting for the future. Um, but back to your original question, we, we, used, um, we used the coordinate system of the Sulci in volumetric space by creating bounding boxes around each of them so that we could compare them in space within each dimension. So instead of flattening out and having a 2D surface where the sulci would be geodistically compared to each other, it was more like keeping within the space and then using spatial geometry as the tool instead of geodesic distance as the tool, where mm -hmm. if we had a 3D box around each sulcus, we can then use each of those 2D planes in the 3D box to relate them in space. I think it would be a good way so that we could possibly in the future incorporate other structures of the brain, like, like structures inside the brain. Um, but I know that people do use a lot of 2D coordinate systems to map along the brain. And initially we did, we did look at geodesic distances between them, um, but we actually found that to, the translations of neuroanatomy actually work by looking at 
spatial relationships volumetrically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that was kind of my, my question finally, because the, um, the brain is not flat, no? mm -hmm. it's not a flat surface. So most of the structure are actually in volume. So I, I was wondering whether the choice of the X, Y, and Z planes was driven by, uh, by methodolo methodological simplicity or a, a neuroscientific uh, justification. So, and it would be like part, part of both, no? Yeah, it's, it's a, I think it's a part of both. First of all, that uh, in terms of simplicity, it's easier to use the planes of the 3D box to compare to each other. And then second, that the translations of neuroanatomy in the queries so it actually worked better in terms of volumetric comparisons rather than geodesic comparisons. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then I, I was also interested in, in the way in which you define the primary, secondary, and tertiary soul side. Mm -hmm. uh, it remind, reminded me of the, the like very lengthy discussions we had with David Germano and Julien Lefebvre when they were trying to do something similar, trying to distinguish. So it, 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 the definition seems to be very intuitive when you first listen about primary, secondary, and tertiary, you say like, Pastosh, you know, ECP, you will just, you know, mm. but then when, when you actually try to define them, it's, it's not trivial at, at all. Yeah. So David and Julien in particular, they, they really struggle to, to find a quantitative way, uh, an algorithm that will tell you these are primary, these are secondary, these are tertiary. They came up with, with one solution. I think that you came up with a classification that in, in part, it's similar to what you would find in, in, in the books, but there are some, some other places where where that, that wouldn't be the case. Um, in particular, I, I think that your, what you call tertiary soul sci, it's something that's kind of probably between secondary, like closer to secondary, you know, it's, they, they even have a name, like normally tertiary folds wouldn't even have a name necessarily. So um, I, I, I was wondering um, what's the role of the stability in the folding for the success of the queries in Neuraland, because, for example, in, in if we take tertiary folds as you know every little branch, mm -hmm. then clearly there's not even a name. I don't know if it would be possible to name them, and wouldn't would would so part one of the question would be wouldn't it make sense, for example, although you are working in, in volume space, to smooth the brain before to remove all tertiary sulci and then get something that would be already much more stable. I don't know like, what, what would be your, your idea on that. And, and then I was also wondering, it was quite surprising that some of the most stable folds were not what one would think are the very stable folds. You know, for mm -hmm. example, I, um, you know, like, like the, the, the cuneal sulcus was one of the yeah. most, stable, even more stable than the calcarine, which is quite surprising. Like, a, a, like a, actually, I didn't even know that that fold existed before. <laughs> And, and then the intraparietal sulcus that appeared to be one of the least uh, mm. stable. It's like a, a main landmark of the parietal lobe. Like everyone mm. has it, but it's true that the geometry is super complex. Yeah. So the, um, would it be, so what's the, what's the, um, the importance of stability? Is Neuralang something that would work only for stable folds? And if we put the question the other way around, um, would it be possible to create a query that produces a very stable result, although it's a fault that we may not even know what's the name. You know, like, like create the thing, the mm. thing, just come up with a, with a query and then check which are the queries, like potentially random queries that, that produce very reliable results and have a, like a neurolang based definition of what's primary, secondary, and tertiary faults based on their stability. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting to create your own create your own query and see what comes up. I didn't think about that. Um, but OK, I'll, I'll go back to your first question, uh, where you asked if we should smooth out the brain um, mm -hmm. to see what comes up first. Well, it, what we wanted to do, OK, well, when I first came up with the classification system, I agree with you, it's super complex. And I actually had seven tiers of stability, which we had to narrow down to three. Um, but then what we wanted to do is we actually wanted to capture all of that complexity first. Um, so we used the mind boggle system and we changed the default settings so that we had, I believe the default is 50 vertices and we changed that, or it was um, a number of vertices. Anyway, we, we increased the complex, the 
complexity that, of the folds that mine particle could extract. And we found that it was so highly complex with, with, with sulci with just a few voxels that, like you said, you don't know what is a sulcus and you don't know what is just a segment. Um, so we ended up with certain with certain features of mind boggle, which was the default of 50 vertices. And then we removed all of the ones which were tiny. So then we came, ended up with what looked like regular sulci with a lot of unlabeled tertiary, which we don't know what they are. Um, I think your next question was about so the stability of, of cuneal and intraparietal. Yeah, for example, yes. Well, the cuneal sulcus was an odd one because you can see that the error bars are really large. And it's because in the left hemisphere, it found, it labeled all of the sulci on the cuneal, on the cuneus. Um, but in the right hemisphere, um, it didn't find any. But then when looking at it individually, actually the ones in the left hemisphere was, were mislabeled as segments of the primary sulci, of the parieto occipital sulcus and the calcarine sulcus. So again, this is part of the trial and error process of creating the queries, which took a long time. Um, and, and similarly, the intraparietal sulcus was a similar problem that Mindboggle didn't extract a single complex structure for the intraparietal sulcus. It really broke it up into many different parts. So this is really what decreased the stability of the sulcus from the queries, um, which is not a fault of the extraction technique. It's just how it was because these are these are separated into many different segments. Um, however, the the query design process was a, a real trial and error process. So we had to individually look at the morphologies of individual query sulci to see how they worked. Did they mislabel? Did they find only one segment or many segments? Um, and then your next your next question. Could you remind me what it was? Well, I, mean, I think that, that that's that's what I wanted to to know. Yeah. And, and then just for finishing, and and it like again relative to the same to the same issue, you know, the, the like the role of stability, and the role of the very small fold. So right. we segmented manually a, a group of ten brains. Mm -hmm. Or there, there were also the brains segmented with with mind mind boggle. Mm -hmm. I remember well. But which sounds kind of a, a very small sample for given given the human human variation. Yes. So when you find that, for example, a, a particular fold is is uh, unstable or something, mm -hmm. like that would it be possible to distinguish or so first, uh, what would you expect to happen when you increase the sample size? Would that mm -hmm. make everything overall more stable mm -hmm. or? Would it be possible that you start to see alternative patterns? So Ono, in particular, they were describing uh, group, groups of people where faults are in this way, and then the same region in some other group of people, like 60% and then 40% will have faults which are in this other way. So if you just combine everyone together, you will get the impression that it's probably an unstable fault mm -hmm. or an unstable query. Although what happens is that you have uh, two alternatives, no? and they, are, they could be potentially, the two of them super stable. Yeah. But just because of looking at them as a single query would give the impression that they are actually not stable. Yeah. Well, that's that's kind of one of the issues with anatomy, right? Because everyone has different definitions of where a sulcus belongs to. Like Ono might um, describe a group of sulci as having different morphologies, but another anatomist, like if we increase the sample size of how many we manually segmented, we could also group a, 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 a weird subject into being a segment of a known subject, or we could call it as being a tertiary sulcus, which exists in only one brain. So when we did the manual segmentations, I tried to stick as much as possible to the existing definitions. And I didn't really include any outliers. So we only had a total of 40 sulci, I believe. Uh, yeah, so there were 40 sulci per hemispheres, and they mostly conformed to the the three sources which I, I used in the beginning with the Destrio Atlas, the Rademacher, and Ono. Mm -hmm. okay. And now, now really the really the last one and more like a science fiction type of question. So the, there's many psychiatric disorders where where with reports of variations in, in folding anatomy, like mm -hmm. comes, comes to mind autism, of course, where people have suggested that there's an excess of brain folding and then probably in some other. Uh, disorders uh, decrease, but that would be mostly, I imagine, this tertiary fault. So, 
how could you imagine would be a type of analysis using Neuralang, using this method within the context of psychiatric disorders? What would be the type of thing that you could do? Yeah, so that's actually one of the main applications that what I would like to use Neuralang for is for psychiatric disorders or neurodevelopmental disorders like mm -hmm. autism. And as I mentioned, like if we can track the changes of Celsi over time, it can tell us a lot about not only like the evolution of the brain for each human, but also what this means for its relationship with other structures. So my ideal way of using Neuralang would be to do, I know this is a bit ambitious, but to do like a longitudinal study of how Celsi form over time in the same in the same person. So I looked previously at longitudinal analysis in autism, and you can track the changes in like a healthy population or psych or path pathological population. And I would really like to see, I'm really interested to see the changes of Celsi over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but like I was thinking more kind of concretely, what would you expect that a query that would work? In, in neurotypical subjects um, would work less in, in psychiatric, uh, in patients mm. with psychiatric disorder, or would it be some other type of uh, measurement that you would be able to do with, with Neuralang? Oh, um, I expect that it would work the same. Uh -huh. uh, and then it would just be a question of comparing the results in the healthy population and the psychiatric. So it, in theory, I hope that it, it, the queries would be able to work the same. If the Celsi morphologies, if they're there and they're just slightly different, okay. I okay. expect it to work the same. So the, there wouldn't be a difference in the, in the success of the query, but then once the query succeeded, you would be able to look at some other additional parameters of the, the, the anatomy to try to find differences. That, that's the idea, yes. Um, in practice, though, I, I don't know how well that would work out. It, it has to be... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. So now it's the turn for the other uh, reviewer, and it is uh, Michel Doja, who's the director of research at the Grenoble Institute uh, de Neurosciences. So, Michel. Uh, on ne t'entend pas, Michel. Nope. Can, maybe, who's the, the host? We can maybe. We don't want to talk about He is unmuted. Um, we did hear him previously, so I'm not entirely yeah. sure. But it, it, it says mute just now. So mute. Michel, tu peux peut-être vérifier tes settings pour le, le micro, peut-être dans les préférences de Zoom. Ah. Ouais. Ça ne change rien quand tu éteins ou que tu allumes ton micro. Euh... Stéphanie, you have no... I, I muted and unmuted him, but it made no difference. Okay, so Michel said, I try a reconnection. So, okay. Try a reconnection. Wait yes. for him for a minute. It's not going to be long. So, hopefully, he'll be back very soon. You also hear the background noise? Okay. Say that again, sorry. Oh, it's gone now. Ah, hang on. It's back. There's a background noise that we can hear. So Michel is in the waiting room. Yeah. Michel, it's okay. Yes. Yeah. So okay. first of all, <laughs> thank thank you uh, for for the invitation. Thank you to your supervisor for the invitation to have the opportunity to read your manuscript, to make a review, and to participate to the jury. Um, your your um, presentation was very clear, very a lot of uh, nice illustrations, it was very perfect. And uh, the same for your manuscript, a very synthetic uh, manuscript. Maybe some part could have more, in, you, you need maybe to add some additional information. Maybe some part are very short, but uh, we have started to discuss by email uh, about some uh, uh, 
question I have, but um, um, first of all, um, about the predicates, mm -hmm. I don't really understand how do you um, uh, select uh, the predicates. At the end, you have how many predicates did you use for the representation? So I could share my screen again. If you... Yeah. Okay. So we have four for, for, for relative relationships, we have a total of <laughs> uh, 17. And there are seven for the characteristics. Yes, and you, you, you have uh, selected this predicate mm -hmm. based on your on reading uh, several uh, um, uh, textbook, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. But why did you don't try to use some uh, machine learning techniques from text mining to know which specific predicate are more frequent for description of, of CLC, for example, to prove that the predicate you select are the, the, the more frequent? Okay, that, that's, that's an interesting way of translating the queries, but it's not something that I consider to use machine learning. I, I'm not, I don't have a background in machine learning myself, and it's not something I consider to use for this tool. Um, really what we wanted to do is the translations of anatomy were going to be direct from the sources. So if a source describes something as being anterior of, we wanted to use anterior of, and the variations of anterior of were based on the, the observations from the manual segmentations mm. and from the from the trial and error designs. But machine using machine learning is yes, because because now we are very very easy to use a text mining algorithm mm -hmm. to uh, to be able to um, to find the more uh, frequent uh, uh, predicate used mm -hmm. for uh, anatomy description indeed. Mm -hmm. but you are not familiar with machine learning, but I like that. In fact, your work is very oriented to a knowledge representation, and it's very old-fashioned. It's not the, currently it's not mainstream at all because <laughs> uh, people try to remove remove uh, knowledge and knowledge representation and try to uh, use data only. So I like this this old-fashioned AI indeed, <laughs> but. But uh, it will be elegant to show that the predicates you use are, in fact, the predicates that are the more frequent in textbooks. That's just my point. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point, and it's not something <laughs> considered, so we could include it to look at. Yeah, actually... and, and because you, you mentioned also that you use the Allen temporal relation, yes. but it, this is this is exaggerated because Allen is thirteen uh, temporal relation, and indeed you have uh, you you use only before and after or mm -hmm. during. That's all, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's also a pity that you don't mention the work of the Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I think you're scratching against your microphone or something. But there's a terrible background noise. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And um, uh, it's a pity that you don't uh, mention the, the work of Olivier Dameron, who mm -hmm. worked a lot of, of, of this relation, spatial relation in uh, brain anatomy, indeed. Yes, um, I remember from your email, you mentioned this. And looking specifically at the paper, it's true that they do work in spatial relationships. However, um, we're working here in the, in the knowledge representation specifically. Um, and, but it's something that I, I, as I, as I mentioned to you in the email, we will incorporate into the updated version of the thesis. Yes, because, because it, it is, it is same, same line that you work indeed. It's, it, yeah. 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 Um, yes. And um, um, yes, you mentioned that you have, um, in fact, uh, thirty-five queries. Mm -hmm. To describe, it's it will be interesting to put these queries uh, in annex of your manuscript because it's very interesting indeed. Yeah, um, I had a few examples, but it's true. Yes, only three, I guess, I, if I remember. But in an in uh, an appendix 
it yeah. would be uh, interesting. Uh, yes, and, I, I can put yeah. I can put all thirty five into um, the updated version. Yes, and it could be also interesting to have more quantitative information about uh, you have your predicates. Mm -hmm. So how uh, how, uh, how you use this predicate? How frequently for the description of uh, mm -hmm. you, you know we have it's a, it's a pity that in your manuscript we have no uh, quantitative information about the descriptions uh, mm. of, of, of the, the brain anatomy. You understand what I mean? Right, so how often was anatomically anterior? Of yes, for genes? example, yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, okay, yes, I did not include that. Um, I did, didn't calculate that, but we can include it. Okay. And um, it's, it will be interesting also to compare your approach to other techniques. For example, here you, um, you choose to have to introduce knowledge representation uh, to be able to, um, to keep the individual variation of the mm -hmm. anatomy. That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to compare this, for example, with other approach for example, the approach used in brain visa mm -hmm. is uh, it's old fashioned compared to uh, uh, data uh, uh, to neural network approach, you know. Mm -hmm. So it will be interesting to compare in which cases your approach is mm -hmm. superior or maybe fail uh, to, um, to, to this sort of approach more based on, on data, you know. Yeah. Actually, what do you we think? We mm -hmm. did look. We did look to see how well the queries performed when it came to matching it with the Destio Atlas. So I yeah. have here um, a bar plot about the query sensitivity relative to the Destio Atlas in each yeah. hemisphere. Um, so we did this to to look at uh, the comparison to existing atlases. However, um, I think as I, I mentioned in the email, there was there's only 20 sulci that we could check for this yeah. because it only has 20 sulci individually. And for the rest of the sulci, we had to use the methods that we use in the final work. Um, however, yes, we could, com we could uh, compare to the Brain Visa Atlas or um, we could also compare to the Atlas, which is used in Mindboggle itself. Yes, for Deskin example. Atlas, yes. Yeah. And to show, but because it's very interesting, and to 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 know in which uh, in which cases uh, the introduction of uh, of uh, anatomical knowledge, mm -hmm. it's your solution. It's more uh, powerful mm -hmm. uh, than without uh, this sort of information. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, so. It would be it would be a really good next step to compare with um, other existing atlases, which are also based on anatomy. Yes, and to demonstrate that uh, it's, it's a good idea or, mm. or, uh, to to introduce because uh, um, it's difficult to represent, of course, uh, you know that uh, to to represent anatomy and species. Yes, yes. and um, I'm I'm wondering if it's sufficient to use uh, the, the your predicates to represent all the situations. Because for example, in anatomy for the central sulcus, mm -hmm. sometimes the, the anatomists uh, um, speak about a uh, end knob for the central sulcus. You know, you have a very, a form similar to a W. Yes. It, it, they call yes. this the end knob. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, how do you represent that indeed? You know, it's not, do you think it's sufficient to have only uh, spatial predicates mm. to represent uh, um, uh, the, the, all the variation of anatomy, the, mm. the, the, the subtlety or, mm. you know, what is your, yeah. So so the point where the, we're trying to convey in the work is not looking at um, trying to prove that we can show different anatomical variations. It's more like showing how by representing the anatomical descriptions, we can actually localize sulci. So if we use the descriptions from the literature, how well do they actually 
identify cell C. So if the central sulcus has a W formation, um, yeah. if this does not affect its spatial representation or its relationships to other cell C, then it should be returned as being part of the central sulcus mm -hmm. anatomy. So the, the morphology, the individual morphology is something that we look at after the designing the query. So what actually returns from our work, but it's not part of the identification process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are not all, many situations where you, it was necessary to introduce more mm -hmm. um, knowledge to be able to uh, take into account of, of, of these individual variations. Yeah. Do you, do you encounter a specific situation where we need to introduce, uh, I don't know which sort of information to take into account of, uh, of individual uh, uh, modification, variation? And, you know. Yeah, we, we came across this when we were looking for, okay, I can give you two examples. The first yeah. one is um, the precentral sulcus and postcentral sulcus, which are parallel to the central um, and they were really difficult to localize because they were in such close proximity and because they were so similar. And as a result of that, we introduced the predicate of dominant relativity. So a lot of times, so see, we're overlapping in terms of their spatial, spatial um, where they were in space on the brain. So because they were overlapping, we introduced dominant relativity as our solution. Okay. And uh, another case where we didn't find a solution yet is um, on the medial surface, we have a lot of sulci which are in concentric formations, like mm -hmm. the colossal and then the cingulate and paracingulate or superior rostral. And we looked into, um, what, as I mentioned, using star calculus to define trajectory. Um, but in the end, it actually did not help in the identification process. So it's something that we could work on to, to fix, um, to look specifically for these sulci, but everything was really trial and error process for looking at anatomy. Yeah. And for the, um, I made several works on the visual uh, system and the calcarine sulcus is very, very different from one individual to another one. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have specific um, knowledge for, for or specific difficulty to, um, to uh, check for this, uh, this sulci, calcarine sulcus? Well, the calcarine sulcus was a primary sulcus in our yeah. case, and we used the Destrio Atlas to take the primary sulci because they were our reference points. So we needed to, to make sure that they were actually yeah. there and reliable. So the calcarine sulcus is not it, something it, that it, you're like... It, it was not uh, very um, viable from individual in your experience? Ah, okay. Well, when I did the manual segmentation of the calcarine sulcus, actually it was the least variable. Yeah. From the primary. Okay. Okay. Like um, the parietal occipital, for example, was much more variable because it, it bifurcates. Oh, uh -huh. okay. Okay. Uh, if you're if you're interested in the manual segmentation data, I can send that to you. Oh yes. We have yeah, we have you. probability maps for each of the sulci from the manual segmentations with values of actually how how much overlap there is between them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I really like uh, your work on, around the stability of uh, the population uh, using your um, uh, the Ellinger distance and so on. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think I have no more question. Yes, try to compare with another approach. I, I guess that this will uh, give mm -hmm. more po more. Um, uh, yes, interest in your work indeed, if you compare. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Michel. So now we're going to move on to the uh, examiners and uh, we'll start with Stephanie Forquet, a postdoc in Bordeaux, I assume in the team of Michel Thiebaud. Thank you. Stephanie, it's you. Uh, thanks for, for the presentation and congratulations for presenting a topic that is highly complex and quite technical at times in a very clear and uh, understandable manner. So very well done um, for that. Um, 
most of the questions I had, I have to say, you already addressed. But there is a couple of questions that are left. The first one is, and that briefly came up, but you didn't really comment on it yet, is why you chose those numbers. So why 10 for manual mm. uh, segmentation and 52 for automatic? Oh, <laughs> the 10 subjects was, it was really just a matter of time. Um, it was really time consuming to do okay. all of these <laughs> manual segmentations. And because it was a collaborative work, um, everything had to be checked over Zoom before it was cool. And um, it, so it really just took a lot of time. So if, if we had more time, I would have really enjoyed to do more segmentations and have really better numbers to back up what we see. But there just wasn't enough time for that. And the 52 was, um, we took a data set of about um, 80 and then we had to eliminate a few. Um, don't recall why it was a long time ago, but uh, it, we only had 52 viable options where we had 50% male and 50% female and all right-handed. Right. Okay. Um, just as a point of reference, how long did it take you to do <laughs> one frame manually? Oh, um, at my peak, I think it took me two days to do two hemispheres. Uh, but that's at that point, I was really just, I was seeing Salsi everywhere. So I had to <laughs> stop. Um, speaking of the two hemispheres, did you find a clear difference or even an asymmetry in variability between the left and the right hemisphere? So when it came to the queries, how they found how they localize Celsius per hemisphere in terms of the probability maps, uh, there was no, there were no significant differences per hemisphere nor per gender. Um, but something that I do would like to look into, and actually I will do it for the updated version, is to look at differences in stability between hemispheres and between genders, because that's not something I looked at and I'd like to. And at the moment, if I get it right, you only looked at right-handed participants, right? That's right. Do you expect to see a different pattern uh, or different type of variability in left-handed people? Well, I expect since there were no significant differences using only right-handed people, then I expect not to have any significant differences in left-handed people, but uh, it, could, it could be, but I don't expect it. Um, and also you nicely showed the distribution of primary, secondary and tertiary sulci between the lobes mm -hmm. um, and you applied the, I think it was the four lobes if I'm not mistaken at the moment, mm -hmm. frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital. Um, what about other lobes? So is this lobar dogma about how many lobes the brain <laughs> might have, um, including the insular, the limbic? Mm -hmm. Why did you choose to use the four main lobes? because we only identified Celsius on the neocortex. So mm -hmm. um, we didn't include limbic lobe Celsius except for, we looked also for the intralimbic sulcus, but we, I think we only found a few results for those, but limbic lobe was pretty much excluded as well as the insula. Okay. Um, let me see what else there is. Um, boom, boom. Overall, would you, how would you rate your agreement with the atlases that you used? Was there anything that you found that surprised you that goes against the atlases? Would you say that we need to completely rewrite anatomy and come up with a new definition? Uh, definitely not rewrite anatomy because it's already really complex as is. And everyone, if people start adding their own definitions based on data-driven approaches, it can get even more complex. So uh, I really want to stress that this is a data-driven method to look specifically at our population of subjects. And I don't think that this should be applied to the general humanity yet. Um, but the point is that this is really supposed to be a jumping off point to have like a global way of identifying Celsius. And then maybe we can draw conclusions for general anatomy. But at this point, no. That's a good answer. Um, if you could go back and redo the project. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that, having finished it now, that you learned that you would do different if you had to do it again? Hmm. I really wanted to look at applications of our method to pathology. And um, really it was just because 
um, I don't think got to that point in time yet. There was a lot to learn along the way. So if I could, if I could start the PhD again, knowing everything I know now, it would be really great. I feel like I could use all of these tools at maximum efficiency and then really use it for applications of neuroscience. Great. Um, and how would you see your work integrate with other methods and other fields like uh, we mentioned before psychiatry, neurodevelopment, maybe neurology, but also at the very beginning of your talk, you talked about the um, gyri and the white matter. So how would you see your work integrate with all of that? Well, um, Demian with another PhD student is looking at applications of Neuralang for neurosurgery. So they're specifically looking at uh, how this can be used in conjunction with actual clinical work. And that would be, that would be an ideal um, application for this. Um, as I mentioned, it would be really interesting to look at Neuralang comparing healthy participants and pathological, um, or is, is that the correct term, pathological participants. Um, and as you know, I also know a bit about white matter. And I also know that they have endpoints in certain cortical regions. And I, I would be really interested to see basically the relationships between them. So before I can make comparisons in healthy and non-healthy, I really want to see how these relate to each other um, using a data-driven approach instead of just using literature sources. Right. Thank you. Um, that's it from my point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so now the questions are for the second examiners. Uh, Philippe, you should... Yes, thank you, Olivier. So, um, uh, thank you, Antonia, for your very nice presentation. So I really enjoyed uh, listening to you and uh, I really appreciate how you were, you were pedagogical and didactic during your presentation, which has as well well illustrated. Um, so, and I wanted to congratulate you for that. So now I have a few questions. Um, uh, I would like to maybe to step back to uh, the definition of the bounding boxes uh, that encompass the, the Sulci. Mm. So um, I was wondering uh, how you choose the size of these bounding boxes, uh, whether it's a minimal bounding box that uh, uh, includes uh, the, any sub size or whether uh, you have some uh, user defined parameter or threshold just to uh, select. So the bounding boxes were uh, a description of actually how we compare each of the Celsi to each other. So the, the Celsi were compared to each other using intervals mm -hmm. and the intervals were from a range of the lowest value on the dimension and the highest value in the dimension. And these basically signify the bounding boxes, the minimum value and, and the maximum. Okay. Value. And so um, do you think that you could integrate uh, in your set of queries uh, some measures of uh, 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 uncertainty quantific quantifications based, for instance, on physiology, or stuff like that, that could help you, for instance, uh, uh, in some cases where it's not clear uh, whether some subsidy is a uh, uh, in front of the other on a, uh, on a side, uh, on the medial part compared to the other? Or mm. could you generalize your uh, grammar to some extent to integrate some uh, a center a center uncertainty quantification? Sorry. Um, I'm not familiar with uncertainty quantifications, um, but basically all cells begin as being general. So they exist on certain planes and then with the complexity of queries, we narrow it down to what we want. So the 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 specificity of sorry, the, the specifications of each query are are mutable themselves. Okay. Um, you you mentioned during your presentation some uh, again some applications uh, in neurodevelopment, for instance. Mm -hmm. So as you know, um, during uh, the early stage of uh, human life. So 
the human brain is uh, at the beginning not circumvoluted and the first uh, um, gyrus are, are growing and giving uh, rise to also the presence of Solsi. And mm -hmm. so because your approach is uh, semi-hierarchical or hierarchical, mm -hmm. so you definitely need, I guess, uh, to rely on the presence of certain size to make some uh, reliable inference. So could you, do you have any idea of uh, uh, from what uh, age you could apply, at what age you could apply your um, neural uh, processing mm -hmm. uh, to neural de developmental data? Well, I expect that if there are a minimum of two sulci, you can relate them to each other. So first you can say, is there a sulcus? And you can find this basic from, from a characteristic of depth. If there's only one sulcus, you say, is there a sulcus? And if there's two, you can say, okay, you have two sulci, which one is deeper as an example? And then you relate the other one to the deeper one. So I expect that as long as there is at least one sulcus, at least two sulci, then you can relate them to each other. Okay. And do you think that it will be uh, very demanding in terms of uh, human resources and computing time to to process uh, some database in a uh, some database of uh, neural developmental data, or, or is it almost uh, reachable in a in a couple of months? Yeah, at the moment the Solsi, the queries are not that efficient, so they do take time. But we're working on making them faster. With, with, uh, with Demi and I are working on this together. Okay, and what about the translational aspect between uh, species, for instance? Uh, non-human primates and, and humans. So mm. do you have any intuition on how you could uh, uh, apply or convert uh, your human-based queries to uh, uh, NHP uh, queries? Well, it's not something we've done. So we ha we've only used Neuralang on human subjects, but it would be, I, I would be really interested to see how this translates to other primate species. I feel like as long as there is at least one reference sulcus, then you can make comparisons to other sulci. So there might not be the five that we used in mm -hmm. all subjects, but if there's at least one, the central sulcus or the lateral fissure, then you can at least make relationships to each other, to, to each other in terms of the other sulci. And then also you can look at which sulci across species had the same characterizations, because maybe they don't exist uh, on the same place in space, but maybe they have the same relationships is, is something we could look into. Okay, so maybe now just to finish a couple of more general questions. So what's the um, strongest uh, feature or assets you have developed uh, along your PhD during this, uh, these years? And uh, how could you, how do you will rely on, on it uh, in the future? Um, I feel like the first one is our data set of 10 manually segmented brains. Uh, usually to do manual segmentations, as I mentioned to Stephanie, is really time consuming and it takes a lot of uh, time and agreement across anatomists. So we had to work with uh, Nikos Macris. Not had to, it was a pleasure. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I feel like our contribution to this work was mainly in um, the field of cell stability. So we we provide a way here to determine stability of sulci within a given population. That's not, not something that you see from a lot of templates or identification mm. of sulcal techniques. And I will, to, just to finish with, how, uh, how did you publish all this piece, good piece of work? Because I, I haven't seen any uh, reference to... So we're in the process now of submitting the Neuralang work, the huge work. Um, really hope it'll be out soon or we'll submit it soon. Um, but the rest of the work we've, we've presented every year at OHBM. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Olivier and uh, Antonia, of course. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Uh, so now I'm going to give the microphone to uh, Damien, who is the uh, PhD supervisor, and then I'll finish with my own questions at the end. So Damien, it's uh, up to you. <laughs> 
Oh no, we can't hear you. No, yeah, Damien, you seem to be, we can't hear you. Maybe you should do like Michel and leave and come back. Why your reconnection, yeah. Is it here now? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. The picture is not, but we hear you. Huh? Your picture is not moving, but I can hear you. Anyway, go ahead. It's not moving. I am moving. I'm breathing even. Okay. Now I'm... I see you. I hear you. Okay, good. It's all good. All good. <laughs> Okay, good, good. Okay, first I want to say this was a, a very challenging work for Antonia. And I recognize that because he started from a knowledge which was almost mm, all from the biology or neuro, neuro anatomy section with no knowledge of computer science. And it was a huge amount of effort to come up and understand the mathematical basis of logic as well as to be able to code, but she was very determined that she wanted uh, to do a work in methods. And she has moved quite a lot since she started and that should be acknowledged. Um, and she brings a very good element to the whole rest of the team and that also should be acknowledged there. Um, so I only have a few lead questions as most of my questions were done while writing the manuscript um, which the first one is how taking back a little bit what the other uh, examiners said how would you complement this to be able to for, for instance bring in sulci or subcortical sections sub subcortical elements as the work is volumetric and in 3d can you see using this type of system to characterize other structures that are on the cortex or subcortical? You are muted. Oh, right. Um, yeah, it would be really interesting to be able to label subcortical structures. Um, as you know, we did a collaboration with other members of the team where we looked at the, we, we anatomically labeled all of these um, images which had their functional regions um, highlighted. So we had to look through all of these images and then label anatomically all of the regions. And this was done in a spatial, in the spatial setting. So I feel like we could use that in order to also devise relationships of the subcortical structures to each other and to the cortex. It would be, it would be an interesting next step to do that. Okay, good. Um, and coming a little bit back to what Michelle asked, if you would say I would magically need like a set of, for instance, four new predicates that work perfectly well, implemented perfectly well, which ones do you think will be the most helpful in making the definitions better? Uh, I think trajectory is quite relevant, especially since in most of the anatomical descriptions, they say that a sulcus is either longitudinal or vertical or anterior posterior or posterior inferior. And these th that's exactly what we wanted to incorporate. But as we showed, it wasn't actually helpful in identifying the queries in the method that we tried. But I would be really interested to work on that to make it better because I really feel like since we're working in a volumetric space here, having the added characteristic of trajectory of each sulcus, I think would really limit each search to look for exactly the one that you want. Okay, and one last one. That's a good answer, thank you. Um, do you think there's an issue here with the brittleness of logic? The issue that things are either true or false. Does, is, is that, that allows you to express knowledge, but is that too restricted sometimes? In some cases it was, and um, I tried to overcome this by adding the dominant relativity. So in some cases, um, because it was either yes or no, it didn't allow for the flexibility that we need in anatomy. So um, by adding dominant relationships to say sometimes yes, but also no, um, we tried to overcome that. Okay, good, thank you. That's all for me, I think, Olivia. Thanks, Damien. Okay, thank you, Damien. So uh, it's my turn to, to finish. Um, so first, uh, I would like to join the others to say that, uh, you know, your presentation was indeed uh, very clear and uh, very well illustrated. Um, 
about your manuscript. I think indeed, as Damien said, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult problem that you tackled. So, uh, um, so you know, well done. <laughs> and uh, um, also, uh, you bring. Uh, I was happy to see that uh, you bring uh, uh, some sort of original approach to uh, what is uh, traditionally do, done in the in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I will also uh, like uh, uh, Michel. Uh, I would like to say that. Uh, I think there was a number of things that were missing in your in your manuscript um, in terms of methodological details. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of things that uh, maybe you could put in annex to mm -hmm. know exactly how you apply your methods. I mean, you use softwares; uh, uh, they all have uh, uh, parameters. They all have uh, you know various things that can influence actually even the result that you produce in terms of uh, probability maps or stuff like that. And so uh, I think it's good to have that as a reference. Uh, one thing that uh, I looked for and that I couldn't find your manuscript, and I think that should be added as well, is uh, what sort of object you're working on. I was not able, as I read the manuscript, to, to see if you were working on voxels or if you were working on nodes of a surface. Knowing a little bit the, 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 the software that you're using, I gathered that, uh, like Blender or Mindboggle, I gathered that you are using uh, um, uh, nodes of a surface. But uh, uh, then you show results in the MNI space that seems to be voxel. So could you first uh, tell me exactly what you're, you're uh, manually extracting and what are you labeling as well? Yeah, the manual segmentations were um, in Blender. We, we used a mesh. Um, but when we uh, ran the probability maps on those, it was in subject space. So using voxels. Um, and, and the mind boggle extracted subjects were also in, in subject space which is the default in HCP data set. And then we non-linearly registered it to MNI. So everything was in, in voxels. OK. Uh, but uh, because you showed an image of, your, um, of the manual segmentations uh, mm -hmm. that uh, have been performed on your 10 subjects. Yeah. And uh, they, 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 it seemed to be like the, the, the gray matter, uh, the, the PIAL surface, the gray matter out, outer surface. And uh, with the folds that don't go in their depth, they just like meet at the at the, at the surface like mm -hmm. that, the jury. And so I I, I seem to have seen that uh, basically it was line drawn on the surface that the manual identification. Am I right? So we you, we did the drawings on the pile surface. You're right, but actually the cool thing about Blender is that you could go inside the brain, um, and it's all hollowed out. So you just have the pile surface, and we actually did the segmentations on the fundus of the sulcus. Okay. So you can't really see it too much on the surface. There were some cases where we connected the segments over the gyrus, which is what you can see on the surface. Um, but it, in general, it was on the mesh. OK. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's important to give those details and explain yeah. methodologically everything you've done. The reason, mostly, I think it's important is that because of something you said uh, that uh, uh, mind boggle when you look at the intraparietal circus, mm -hmm. mind boggle tend to split it in many places, in many uh, pieces. And that's why I think that uh, the representation that you use of sulci is very important for your results. Uh, depending on the sort of object that you manipulate, mm -hmm. uh, your, your sulci are going to be separated in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's going to act on your, on your result, I think. So mm -hmm. it's not that I. Uh, criticize the, the methodological choice that you've made of using mind boggle and stuff, but uh, uh, we need to know exactly about uh, that sort of thing. Yes, I understand. Okay, we'll add this into um, appendices. Okay. Uh, another thing is that uh, I really appreciated in your manuscript uh, the, the anatomical work that is the, the, the description of, of each circus representation that you then used to build your own rules. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's, uh, that's very good because that provides real knowledge, basically, in the manuscript. Um, but I was surprised that uh, something else was missing. And so why did you choose to not uh, mention uh, any of the other methods that exist in the literature to label sulci? I was expecting a, a, a review of that literature, basically. Yeah, um, we, we looked at other so-called parcellation techniques. and. Um, well, the point that we wanted to create was that the, the current labeling techniques which exist have a predetermined set of brain regions 
And it's not that you look first for the existence of a sulcus and then and then label it. It's you have a predetermined set of regions. So we wanted to make the point that we're um, complementing this by adding the, the different process of looking first if it exists and then labeling it. But um, we can add, I, I can add more of a detailed explanation of other circle parcellation techniques. I, I think there's a, there's a lot, uh, I, I understand your, your angle, but I think there's a lot of, uh, of uh, information and knowledge to get in that literature. Mm -hmm. For instance, there is the work in Rennes of Bernard Gibault who uh, was at the LTSC, I think, and then maybe working with Christian Barrio. Anyway, he did, uh, uh, he published a couple of papers on the use of ontology to, uh, uh, to, to, to label sulci, and uh, where it's, he has a number of rules uh, that, uh, for each circus that are quite similar to yours. I think it was like in 2008, around yes, that it's time. the work of Olivier Dameron, uh, Olivier. Okay, yeah. Um, and so, um, uh, in that work, even though maybe you're taking a slightly different angle, there is interesting things uh, which lead me to my, my next question, is that when you label by hand, you, you mention that your procedure or the, the, the anatomist you work with uh, follows a certain order. So, for instance, you're going to label the primary sulci, let's say the central sulcus, and then anterior of that, you're going to find the precentral, and then from there, you're going to propagate your labeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in your then later, you, you say that actually you look, you query your sulci in that order, which sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. But that means something. It means that uh, uh, the, the, the result of your query is dependent of the order in which you did things. Yeah, so absolutely. did you, what do you think of that? And did you explore different ways? Because you might have inconsistencies in labeling. Yeah. Yeah, so that's definitely something that affected the query outcome. Uh, and first, the way that we designed the order of the queries was to reflect the taxonomy that we have, so which is supposed to be intuitive of the, the classical neuron anatomy labeling method. Um, but actually, as I mentioned, we found that it was easier to actually label the extreme ends of each axis first and then go closer to the center. So first we started off with central, pre-central, and then the frontal cell side. But then we found that it was actually the end result that we have, the order is central, and then maybe frontal marginal, inferior frontal, pre-central. So by process of elimination, you get the most extreme ones first, and then you can omit that from subsequent searches and then go closer to the center where the closer sulci were to primary sulci, actually the harder it was to label them using, using our system. So, so I guess it's a question of scales and uh, what you actually call a sulcus. The difficulty is related to that. You know, is it like a large complex of little of folds, or is it just one single fold without branches? Because that defines a little bit the difficulty of your of your goal. And uh, for having labeled quite a lot of sulci myself, uh, I find that this order in saying, you know, I, I've got like a heuristic, for instance, like you, you can start with the most anterior and walk back and, you know, meet in the middle from the, the central mm -hmm. surface, or whatever you find uh, the good order. Often, I do the same. I mean, I, I clearly do the same, but often I've got to go back and forth and correct. Why? Because uh, there are inconsistencies in the relationship you know, and you might label one, one circus like that. And then when you're going to get to the next one, you see that maybe you have to revise your judgment and mm -hmm. have the feeling that your system doesn't allow for that. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And uh, this is one of the limitations of our work that there is follow through. Exactly. So if it if something is mislabeled and it just continues, um, there, there's we don't have a we don't currently have a system to correct for mislabeling. That's definitely a limitation that we we need to fix. Um, but otherwise, uh, sorry, the question was. Uh, the question was about uh, the possible inconsistencies that you might meet mm -hmm. when you want to label something based on what you've labeled first, depending on the order, or do you have to go back and change a labeling that you've done before? And yeah. How yeah. do you? How, how would you think you would implement that basically to succeed into the? Yeah, that's definitely. Um, uh, there were definitely inconsistencies in that regard. Uh, and what we would want to do is, I think it, you have to know the sulcal extraction technique that you're using because we had to, the, 
when we did the manual segmentations, we had much larger and connected Celsi. So the, the queries, even though they were in the same order, they showed different results to the ones that were extracted using an automated extraction system. So then when I, we became more familiar with the mind boggle extracted system, we saw that actually maybe the intraparietal is split up into five. So then you can adjust the query to say, okay, I don't want just one sulcus as a result. I want all of the candidates which fulfill these requirements. So then you can say, I want all of the segments in this section instead of just one. Um, so that's one possible way of fixing uh, this problem. But again, it means that you have to understand how your extraction technique is extracting sulci. Yeah, I agree. When, okay. And again, this means that you have to have a, a good understanding of what the anatomy is supposed to look like. Uh, and this means that you, you're supposed to have a, a good background of the anatomy itself. And what we want to do is we want it to be able to be used for people who don't necessarily have anatomy backgrounds. So we're trying to make it as intuitive for, as, as possible for those people. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll finish with one last question, which is a little more uh, um, uh, a technical detail, but I think it matters. Uh, as you said, uh, the, 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 the representation of the sulci uh, matters, the way to extract them. And uh, um, how do, how, it's not clear to me how your system deals with the, the fact that the same sulcus might have several uh, components, several pieces that are disjointed. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with that? Because I have the feeling that what you call us, what you're going to label is an entity that is entirely connected. Mm. Am I right? In some cases, it's entirely connected. But in some cases, it's broken up into different segments. Um, yes. So depending on the sulcus, based again on, on what we saw individually, we either had um, we, we changed the secondary query, which takes one sulcus from the first one, and we changed it according to the results of whatever came up from that section of the brain. So if that section, if the query which we're looking for came up and had a, a huge mass of different sulci, yeah. then we added a secondary query which said, okay, we're only looking for the most anterior one here. So, so that means that in the end, you're going to have for one label, let's say mm -hmm. super temporal sulcus, you're going to have only one element labeled super temporal sulcus. Yeah, if that's what you want. Yeah, because precisely that's not what I would want. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's the option. Yes, that can have one, three, or four pieces, for instance. Mm -hmm. there, there is the option to, um, if you just have one query which searches for all segments, all pieces of CLC which fulfill the requirements then you don't have a secondary query, that's optional. So you can just say, I want all of the sulci which fulfill the requirements of this description. And that can be one sulcus or it can be seven segments. And then you end up with probability map, which is a representation of all of those segments. So do you think you can add some sort of a constraint like you expect uh, each sulcus to have one, two, three, uh, uh, an interval of number of possible pieces, for instance? Uh... Yeah. I. I... I, I can I consider that as well because like in the literature that say like the precentral sulcus might have zero to five segments, for example, um, but it's not something that we specified in the query. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll st thank you very much. Uh, I, I will you. stop there. And so uh, I think it's all for the questions. So we can all meet in the in the other room. I don't know what you call it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll come back uh, to you uh, when we're finished, uh, Antonia. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Okay. So I invite everyone to go into the breakout room Let's at go. the bottom and select the room. I hang around to make sure that everyone has migrated over. <laughs> it's looking good. Looking good. I will turn off my camera. Yes, you'll still be live. <laughs>
on, you can. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, we've been uh, Antonia. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So we've been uh, deliberating, and uh, so we thought that uh, you delivered a, a good and very clear presentation, uh, really well explained, illustrated, and very didactical. So we congratulate you for that. Um, we also uh, uh, appreciated uh, really a lot the, the body of anatomical knowledge that you produced during your, your PhD and that you put in your work. Um, and that uh, definitely brought uh, some uh, strong originality to, to your work. Um, we appreciated uh, the, the way you answered the question and how it clarified the, the nature of your contribution. Uh, we also would like you to encourage you to uh, share your efforts with the community and uh, basically share resources, manually, uh, the, uh, the manual delineation, segmentations, and also obviously know along uh, uh, if you're contributing to, to that. Uh, and so uh, because of uh, all this, uh, we are very happy to uh, give you the title of uh, Doctor de l'Université Paris-Saclay. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. 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 Oh, thank you. It's a shame there's not a big room to clap. <laughs> uh, or, or to share a glass of champagne. I hope, <laughs> yeah. you know, drink one or another, <laughs> except for Stephanie. She got everything well thought. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. No, seriously. Always ready. <laughs> Thank you to um, to all members of the jury for taking the time to read the thesis and for all of your comments. I take them all in my stride and I will come back with updated versions and put all of the efforts into the community because it's a really great community that I, I definitely used a lot of resources and I hope to put something back. Um, above all, first and foremost, thank you, Damien, for being my supervisor. First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity. It took a lot to learn and you're a really great teacher and uh, especially to be a supervisor during a pandemic I'm sure was not an easy thing and I really appreciate the way that you handled it. Um, I mean thank you to everyone at the in the Parietal team and the Athena team as well because it's really it's a huge team with a lot of, a lot of knowledge and we all helped each other I feel and um, and finally thank you to my parents and to my partner Ben and to my friends. Congratulations again, then. Yes. Before we leave, we yes. would like to tell you something about your manuscript, mm -hmm. uh, which is that, uh, uh, so as you saw during the presentation, we identified the number of things that you should maybe add to the manuscript. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very important for us that you do so. So uh, Damian, uh, you can debrief that with Damian. And mm -hmm. uh, we won't put it on the, the report. I mean, if you're, that's it, you're a doctor. But uh, we count on you to, to uh, uh, include all those things in the manuscript. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, and I appreciate all your feedback as well because it makes this work stronger. But for, for today, relax, we'll speak about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go and enjoy it. Yeah. yeah enjoy, enjoy the day. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you, Thank you all so much. Um, also, Antonio, you want to check YouTube. There's a lot of congratulations in the chat oh, over there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should check the, the link and, and take the time to celebrate remotely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even though the curfew begins today, I, I think. Yeah, that's true. The curfew is, is at eight. That's right. So I'll probably go straight home. Yeah, I'm sure you have something prepared. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Thank you. Have a good day. Congratulations. Everyone. Congratulations Thank again. Thank you so much. And, uh, Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. And Damien, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Yeah, see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye. Bye.